Hi, my name is Manish Tandon and I'm a technical marketing engineer for Cisco working on the Unified Computing Platform, also known as UCS. This video is one in a series of videos that we'll be doing to showcase the architectural advantages of UCS and its unique value propositions. In this video, I'll be talking about the Ethernet switching modes on the UCS Fabric Interconnects. I will be toggling between PowerPoint slides and a UCS system to provide you a better understanding of it. As you might know that there are two Ethernet switching modes in UCS. One is called the end host mode and the other is switch mode. In end host mode, the external LAN sees the UCS system to be an end host with multiple links, which are dot one q trunks. No control plane protocol is active on the uplinks towards the LAN and we have active active usage of uplinks using a concept of pinning, which I'll touch upon later. In switch mode, as the name signifies, STP or spanning tree is active on uplinks and link selection is determined by what the spanning tree topology dictates. Hence, links could be blocking in this case. A thing to note is that in either of the two modes, L2 traffic between the two blades in a UCS domain is locally switched. That is, it does not need to have go, uh, it doesn't need to go upstream to get switched. End host mode of operation is the default mode of operation in UCS. So looking at the system, um, if you were to click on the fabric interconnects, and you can find out what is the current mode of operations for Ethernet. Like in this case, it says end host mode. If you were to change it to switch mode, what you can do is you can click on the set Ethernet switching mode. One thing to keep in mind is that when you move between the two modes, it does require a reboot of the fabric interconnects. Uh, so in this case, I'm going to choose no for now. So as I mentioned, pinning is a concept which is used in end host mode for sending server traffic out on the uplinks. What pinning does is that it takes a server VNIC and maps it to an uplink port or a port channel. All traffic to and fro for that particular VNIC then uses that uplink. You can create a static pin group for a server or an application and by assigning it to a server VNIC, you can have deterministic path coming out of the system. You then need not worry about oversubscription issues where multiple servers could be using an uplink. Like in this case, for let's say an application called Oracle, I can create a static pin group and map it to the support channel. When you do not have a static pin group, what is referred to is, is called dynamic pinning. By dynamic pinning, what is meant is that as servers come up, they get pinned to one of the uplink ports or port channels. So in this case, I have three uplinks, uh, two individual links and one port channel and automatic rebalancing of the server VNIC traffic happens every 300 seconds. What is meant by that is that let's say, let's imagine a scenario in which you have nine server NICs to begin with, three are pinned here, three are pinned here, and three on the port channel. Later, three servers out of those nine go offline or they're shut down. And incidentally, all three of them which were shut down, let's say belong, were mapped to this port channel. So in that scenario, what you'll have is you'll have three servers still pinned here, three servers pinned here, and this will is not being used at all. So every 300 seconds, what the system is going to do is it's going to take the available uplinks, look at the server VNIX, it uh, are pinned to it, and will do the automatic rebalancing. So in this case, what will happen after 300 seconds is that this link will carry two server VNIX, this will carry two, this will carry two. So th this auto happens automatically. Looking at the system, if you were to go to the LAN tab and you click on the LAN pin groups, in this case, you can actually create a pin group. Like in this case, I created a pin group called Oracle in which it will be using port 19 on A side. And in case that fails, it will use port 19 on the B side. Now, then all you need to do is you need to go to the servers. You select a let's say a, a policy, you click on network, look at the VNIC, click on modify to set its settings. And in this case, you can choose 
the pin group that you are uh, you want use this server VNIC to use. So now, so the next slide talks about the active active usage of uplinks, and as I mentioned, in end host mode, all links are forwarding irrespective of what the upstream topology is. But if the same topology was to be, to, to be taken to switch mode, in this case, the links which are towards the primary root are forwarding, the rest are blocking. So end host mode of operation provides the maximum bandwidth out of the system without any uh, special upstream topology. Looking at scalability, uh, as spanning tree protocol is not run in end host mode, so hence the control plane is completely unoccupied. Uh, the CPU on the fabric interconnects doesn't have to process PPDUs, etc. Um, end host mode is also the least disruptive to the, to the upstream network. Um, when you connect uh, fabric interconnect in end host mode to an upstream network, we do recommend that you turn on port fast type edge along with BPDU filters and BPDU guards. So in this case, what happens is even if the fabric interconnects lose uplinks or they reboot it or firmware upgrade happens, etc., nothing changes from a network perspective upstream. Um, one more thing to keep in mind is that the MAC learning does not happen in end host mode on uplink ports. It only happens in server port on on server ports. In switch mode, we do learn MACs on both server and uplinks. So in end host mode, what happens is you do not run into any MAC address limitations that they are present on the 6100 of the fabric interconnects. Within UCS, there are two types of MAC addresses. They're called static and dynamic. Static are the MAC addresses which are given as part of the service profile. So when you create a service profile and you choose a MAC address, that is what is termed as a static MAC address and there will be an entry for it. Other things like VMs for which the MAC address is assigned by the hypervisor and not by the UCS system, those MACs are learned and termed as dynamic MACs. So looking at the system, if you were to SSH into any of the fabric interconnects on the web, you can connect to the NX, plane, NX OS plane of it. If you were to do a show pinning border interfaces, so that tells you what are your border interfaces and what server VNICs are pinned to it. And if you were to do a show MAC address table, and if you were to look at all the MAC learning that has happened, you'll notice that none of the MAC addresses are actually learned on any on the uplinks in this case. So it's, it's very scalable from that point of view. The next is the fabric failover. Fabric failover is only applicable in end host mode. Using fabric failover, what happens is that instead of having any teaming software on the host itself, the active passive NIC teaming is, is offered as part uh, of the fabric services. So when you create a VNIC, all you have to do is you have to specify that as a fabric failover VNIC. What happens then in that case is that if this is the primary path and if there is a disruption anywhere along the primary path going out of the UCS interconnect, traffic is seamlessly sent across the other path. So both of the paths are active active for every v, for VNICs and a VNIC can go on either of these paths depending upon how the configuration is set up. So in this case, the OS will see the VNIC to be up you do not require any team software on the host itself. So it removes a layer of management. Uh, you don't have to worry about the teaming software version, their configuration, etc. In version 1.4 of UCS, we have also added support for hypervisor based soft switches to utilize this feature. To configure this feature, what you need to do is when you choose a VNIC, all you have to do is you have to enable fabric failover. When you do that, you will notice that the fabric ID changes from the earlier A to A-B. What that means is that A is going to be the primary path for this VNIC, and in case that fails, it will go on to B. Similarly, if I, I, I can create another VNIC, I can give it a name, I can give it a pool, 
I can specify the VLANs in it. In this case, I can say B and enable fabric failover. When I do that, in this case, you'll notice that the fabric ID says B-A. What that means is B is the primary path, and if that fails, it moves on to A. So fabric failover, again, is, is a feature only available in endhost mode and is unique to the Cisco UCS platform. Looking at the best practices for upstream connectivity, if you have a VPC VSS upstream, it is highly recommended that you port channel all the links going into that layer. So the fabric interconnects are not VPC peers. On the fabric interconnects themselves, they, these would be regular port channels, but you can port channel into a VPC port channel. Similarly, if you do not have VPC VSS upstream, we still do recommend that you port channel any available links where they are applicable. As we discussed in end host mode of operation, even if they are not port channels, we will not be blocking on any of the links. But port channels are recommended for the least amount of moving paths when things change or you know links fail, etc. So port channel wherever you can and turn on port fast, network type edge, and BPDU guard and filter for the links connecting to the UCS domain. Hopefully this gave you um, a good overview and the advantages of UCS end host mode um, Ethernet switching. Please go to www.cisco.com front slash go front slash UCS. Thank you for your time.